All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Majestic Simpkins School for Human this Rights. Is being recorded. Tonight we have another action-packed uh, special on uh, the history of human rights in South Carolina featuring our special guest speaker, Dr. Eric Gelman. But before we get to Dr. Gelman, uh, we have a poetry reading from one of our students. Um, Nicole, the floor is yours. Okay. Good evening, everybody. How are you? I'm excited to open up for you all. Um, actually, I like to share a poem that, um, that I wrote. Um, and actually, um, I think I told you all a little while ago when we first started that I was diagnosed with breast cancer back in 2020 um, that was back during the pandemic. So I did write a book and it is, um, uh, I don't know how to do the camera really well here, but it's a breast of faith and, um, and it has a couple of poems and it's basically about my breast cancer journey. So at our last class, when we talked about um, Ms. Simpkins and, and, you know, and how she fought for um, health care equity, um, that is something that I am very interested in um, fighting for as well in terms of my experience as a breast cancer patient. Um, I mentioned before that there is a huge disparity in, um, in mortality rates among um, African-American women and um, white women in terms of uh, breast cancer. So with my poem, while it is directed to breast cancer solely when I wrote it, um, it is now my experience that it is basically directed to injustice as well. So I like to share with you all. And the title is, um, and basically the book is, You Can't Take What Is Mine. And again, that's referring to breast cancer and my human rights, okay? So no time for breast cancer. I don't have time for you. I got too much to do. Who has time for this? Breast cancer, you are already through. Here you are, creeped in my body. The devil is a liar. Not today, I'm sorry. You may have invaded my milk duck cells, but that time will tell you won't prevail. Yet you set out to rob, steal, kill, and destroy, testing my faith and tampering with my joy. I've suffered pain and I cried many tears, but glory to God, you did not give me the spirit of fear. Faith over fear, whom shall I be afraid? Jesus died on the cross. My debt has already been paid. By his stripes, I am healed. The Lord is my strength and my shield. Breast cancer, get ready to flee. Crept in my body, trying to kill me. Love, prayer, hope, and faith will get me through. I will say it again, I don't have time for you. I am grateful for a God who forgives. I choose life and I shall live. I believe in his word because Jesus the Christ lives. Great, great job, Nicole. Thank you so much for a truly inspirational poem. And Again, folks, if you have anything that you want to read before class, uh, please let Becky know as soon as possible. Again, we want the Majesta School to be an experience where everyone participates. And so once again, I want to thank you, Nicole, for such a great poem. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you. All right, and Brett, I, I know you wanted to say something to start class off this evening. Well, I want people to be able to get a copy of this book, Invisible No More. It's Dr. Green's first hardback publication after 300 plus publications. And it's about the history of Jim Crow at the University of South Carolina. Um, he's gonna have to write a sequel because Jim Crow is not gone yet at the University of South Carolina, but it really does go back to the beginning in the early 1800s and follows it through with uh, different essays de dealing with the different eras. In this book, we have author signed, author discount available books at our office. Uh, and you can call Daniel at 803-661-8000 and arrange your pickup or get one in the mail. So hurry, 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 we don't have many left. And so after that little commercial, Dr. Green, I'd like to set this thing up talking about how 
how history is denied. I mean, that is something that the Majeska School is about. But I couldn't have been more stunned uh, finding out things I found out after we started the Majeska School. And we, the first, we started working with the school, setting it up in 2014 in her home. And it's where our office was. And I had occasion to, the first, first year we did the class was 2015. And I had occasion that spring to uh, be a speaker at Tulane in uh, New Orleans. And this was after the Supreme Court um, struck down the, the Shelby ruling, which determined that the United States was uh, post-racial and we didn't have to have uh, the Section 5 coverage for the racist states anymore. And so this was a meeting of Southern executive directors of voting rights organizations, a pretty tired old beat down lot. And so I gave my little pitch and was trying to cheer people up and quoted my mentor. I said, <laughs> my mentor was asked one time, how do you keep doing this decade after decade? And she thought, and she said, well, I guess I'm just selfish because it makes me feel good. And after I finished, somebody came up to me and they said, I know who your mentor was. I said, who? He said, Majeska Simpkins. I said, how do you know that? He said, well, I wrote my PhD on the conference she put together in 1946 in Columbia, the Southern Negro Youth Congress. I had heard her mention that. I had heard her say that everything would have been different if it hadn't been smashed. That was her term, smashed. I guess I was just too busy, too young and romantic, fighting the immediate you know, things at, at hand to dig into that at all, because this was 30 years later, it was that I was with Ms. Simpkins from mid 70s till she passed in 92. And so this is 2015, a long time later. And so the fellow was Sekou Franklin, who's a PhD history instructor at Middle Tennessee uh, University. And he said, do you know Eric Gelman? I said, no. He said, well, Gelman has a book out now called Death Blow to Jim Crow. And so I tracked down Gelman and, and drug him uh, willingly to a conference in 2016 that we put on at what was once Harbison Junior College, which was where they held some of the, the Harbison Junior College was where Majeska, and I didn't know this until 2015 either, Majeska had a leadership training school that she started uh, 70 years before we started ours in the same house we started ours studying the same things, dealing with the same problems we're dealing with 70 years later. And so if they can keep erasing your history, you think you keep thinking you're the first person to get screwed. And you know, you've got to start all over again and nobody's done anything before. And so the, the, the work that Gelman's done to put together the history of the, of the National Negro Youth Congress and expressly touches us, the Southern Negro Youth Congress, has been a really sound footing for us to understand the historic work that was done in the 30s and 40s before the human rights movement was domesticated. And Dr. Green, I'm gonna give it back to you. You may have some more academically academic praise for Dr. Gelman, but I just wanted people to know that uh, that's we came to Gelman the, the interesting way, actually through the hundreds of pages of FBI files that uh, Seku Franklin gave us also helped. All right, and thanks so much for that, Brett. I think that it's easy for us as academic historians to forget the kind of impact we have on the public. And I think that example of the conference you've mentioned is a good one. And in the chat, I'll put the actual, uh, an actual story about that 2016 conference uh, that was held in Columbia a few years ago that might be worth looking at um, while we have tonight's conversation. So to introduce uh, Dr. Eric Gelman, uh, I'll just mention a few quick things about him. Again, he has an extraordinary career as a labor historian. Uh, he's currently an associate professor of history at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, a lot of his work deals with working class and urban life in particular. Uh, Death Blow to Jim Crow, the National Negro, uh, National Negro Congress and the Rise of the Civil Rights. This is one of several of his books. Uh, his most recent work is Troublemakers, Chicago Freedom Struggles Through the Lens of Art Shea. Um, he's also worked on other books as well, and I know that he's also uh, working on several projects because if you're an academic, your entire life is working on several projects at once, uh, but the government can certainly talk about that during his presentation this evening. Uh, but I am incredibly excited to welcome Dr. Eric Goldman to the Majestic School. This is, of course, not his first rodeo with us. Uh, he's been with us before, and he's always provided students with a great and enlightening presentation. So 
Dr. Gilman, welcome once again from Justice and Penn School of Human Rights. Well, thanks so much, Professor Green, and thank you, Brad, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I've been asked to talk about the Southern Negro Youth Congress tonight, and I'll do that for a little while, but I'd also love if we could be informal so that to get into a dialogue with all of you. So make sure you just write down some questions. Um, I'd love to just, you know, get into a conversation um, after my formal presentation. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I do have a few slides to show you along the way, um, as well as uh, a kind of show and tell thing uh, that I'll get to in just a bit. All righty, can everyone see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so what was the Southern Negro Youth Congress? Why did it matter? Um, today I'm gonna talk about its history and um, how it really represented a challenge of young black activists in the late 1930s and 1940s um, in what they thought their generation was going to give a death blow to Jim Crow. They weren't trying to seed the next generation of activists, although they ended up doing so. Um, they really thought that their generation was going to tear down uh, Jim Crow in America. Um, so in order to do that, um, I researched this book. This is my first book that I wrote, Death Blow to Jim Crow. It took about 10 years to write, a lot of different archives, a lot of people in, in characters burn their papers. Um, so I had to go to all these different archives to find their letters and generate a new archive. And among the things I found that was just remarkable was uh, the preserved papers of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. So the Southern Negro Youth Congress was the youth arm of the National Negro Congress, although the two organizations really um, weren't that distinct from each other. Members of the NNC became members of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. And um, by the time you get to the South Carolina chapter, you see older people getting involved with the Southern Negro Youth Congress. So there's an intergenerational aspect as well. Um, so, you know, the Southern Negro Youth Congress was just this um, fascinating organization. So the NNC began in 1936 in Chicago. And um, in order to understand the Southern Negro Youth Congress, let me just say a few words about the NNC. The NNC was the brainchild of John P. Davis, who was a Washington DC activist. And it, uh, basically it sought to take advantage of this moment of convergence in 1935, 1936, where it suddenly seemed possible to organize African-Americans into a more militant civil rights type body to attack Jim Crow. Um, they did so because at this midpoint of the Great Depression, uh, the labor movement seemed to be stirring in a new direction with John Lewis walking out of the AFL convention in 1935 after he got into a fist fight with the president of the Carpenters Union. And thereafter, he and some others formed the Congress of Industrial Organizations or the CIO that had to be explicitly anti-racist because they sought to organize industrial workers across racial lines. And so the NNC forms in 1936. Um, and the other big piece of convergence, I think, is the convergence of radicalism in America. As you all probably know, this is the beginning of the Popular Front period, where the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, liberals and other radicals stop fighting each other over sectarian ideas and actually start working together. And the reason they do that is because of the real fear that fascism was spreading rapidly around the world, including in America, and they needed to do something in an emergency type situation. So to ally with each other to fight back against fascism. And anti-racism in America became a huge priority in that fight back. So the 1936 inaugural convention of the NNC begins in Chicago during a snowstorm. Yet even during that snowstorm, over 500 delegates appeared 
Um, the crowd was so huge that people actually huddled outside in winter coats um, to listen to the sessions that were broadcast on loudspeakers outside the auditorium on the south side of Chicago. And as you, as you can see here by this slide, it was a who's who of African American organizers, African American artists, activists, cultural figures, etc. cetera. Um, on the bottom of the screen, you can see a picture of A. Philip Randolph, who became the first president of the National Negro Congress. Langston Hughes is down there. Um, you've got representatives from the NAACP, the Urban League, et cetera. Um, and what I thought was cool about one of the articles describing this conference was someone said, there were no um, big eyes and little U's, meaning that you know an ordinary person off the street was treated the same as some of these big time intellectuals and celebrities. Um, and the other thing I have on my screen here, which is uh, Richard Wright's um, piece about this first National Negro Congress, um, where he really goes into detail about how excited he is for this new movement to take shape. He even calls it um, a second Bill of Rights, a Negro Bill of Rights, and calls for widespread, widespread transformation, um, hoping, like others who formed in this period to push the New Deal, to push Franklin Roosevelt further to the left, to embrace civil rights, to embrace labor activism, et cetera. Um, and so out of this body of the National Negro Congress comes the Southern Negro Youth Congress a year later. And um, the Southern Negro Youth Congress at first starts as a smaller group because it's intentionally for youth organizers. But it does some remarkable things in its early existence, which I won't go into in great detail because I know you all wanna know about South Carolina. But the first real place of emphasis for the Southern Negro Youth Congress is Richmond, Virginia. And so in Richmond, Virginia, young organizers ally with the lowest of the low in terms of how um, you know, the labor movement was defined in Richmond, which is tobacco stemmers. Tobacco stemmers got paid hardly anything per day. Many of them were old, others were, had disabilities. Um, there were people who couldn't do other forms of work. And these tobacco stemmers were quite radical and they were 100% African-American. And they started forming a union in 1937 um, and the Southern Negro Youth Congress, these young um, African-American organizers were part of that effort. So this younger generation allied with an older generation at first tobacco stemmers, but then increasingly um, tobacco workers in Richmond's factories. And they created an industrial union. And so what's remarkable about this story, I think, is that well before the CIO decided to go south and try to organize black workers, well before anyone else tried to do this, African-American workers, along with young organizers in the SNYC, successfully organized people who were thought to be unorganizable. They won several strikes, they won wage increases, and really they changed the mood of Richmond, Virginia. Um, they organized all kinds of cultural workshops. Um, organize, the organizing changed the opinion of several ministers in Richmond from being very much against unions to pro-union. And they organized for civil rights um, in the city of Richmond, you know, the former con Confederate capital. So this was an incredible task um, that showed the larger national CIO that you could indeed come south and organize black workers. And in fact, black workers didn't need to be organized. They were self-organizing. And I think this has a real sort of connection to current day struggles, in particular, the Amazon struggle that just occurred in Long Island, um, where it was a self-organized union by Chris Smalls and other people that really got um, a victory in Long Island where the struggle in Bessemer, Alabama continues because they didn't take the same approach. Um, the Southern Negro Youth Congress is really interesting too in that what they're doing is they're responding to a particular moment in history um, where 
young black college students are graduating at a rate never seen before in American history, but they're graduating into a context where there really are no jobs for them. And so instead of being careerist, a lot of these young activists become lifelong activists instead. They sought to break down Jim Crow and become organizers in labor, but also in other fields. Um, and what they're responding to largely was a famous article by Langston Hughes in 1934 called The Cowards at the Colleges, where he called many black college students spineless Uncle Toms full of mental and moral evasions. So that was probably a little bit over the top, but what Hughes was criticizing was the fact that a lot of uh, black colleges at the time were very conservative, right? They, they had very conservative politics and probably that was for self-preservation, right? That they feared that, um, you know, donations would dry up or um, the federal government would pull aid with the case of Howard University. But Hughes and others were challenging this new generation of students to become more active um, in terms of their activism and for this young generation to really become more radical. And as such, they look back to the slave rebels. They're publishing and writing about, you know, um, Nat Turner and others and, um, you know, slave resistance, um, et cetera. And they're trying to find a new usable past for militant forms of activism. And I think, you know, in many ways, the Southern Negro Youth Congress was on the cutting edge of this kind of activism. Another chapter of the Southern Negro Youth Congress that I wanna talk about briefly is what they did in Washington, DC. So they weren't even quite formed in DC yet as a chapter of SNYC. They were the Washington Youth Federation. But what they did was quite remarkable. They joined hands with the National Negro Congress and formed a giant coalition. And the, the number one priority of the NNC and the young people in DC was police brutality. That young activists had had enough of police trying to push them out of urban spaces, segregate them, beat them, arrest them for no particular reason. And as a result, they built a giant coalition of forces looking for the kind of economic as well as physical security. They're, they're defining freedom in this much sort of wider way. And they're also defining lynching in a much wider way than say the NAACP and Walter White. They're suggesting what John, D, John P. Davis called not lynching, but the lynch spirit, which involved not just actual lynching in the South, but police brutality, um, you know, show trials that railroaded um, defendants and particularly working class black men into prison. And so they were organizing against that kind of mentality in the nation's capital and succeeded in remarkable ways. They put enough pressure on the police department and local authorities that in fact, um, there was a, an, an entire review and reform of the police department. Um, and in the late 1930s, an entire year went by without a single African-American being killed by the police department. And I know that doesn't sound like a great feat, but considering the amount of brutality that had occurred every year before then, it was quite remarkable. And so this picture here is one of the massive protests that the NNC inspired in Washington, DC. And then after the police brutality protests, they translated that energy into protests during the early war period for jobs for African-Americans. So while Randolph's group, you know, the March on Washington movement was able to gain access through the FBPC and this executive order 8802 for fair employment in government war industries, um, the NNC pushed the agenda and made sure it was enforced. So they had all kinds of protests in Baltimore and DC and other places to get African-Americans um, hired in these plants, including this one um, that was in the Washington DC area where many black women got great jobs during the war um, as a result of this employment-based activism that stemmed out of the police brutality activism that preceded it. So in addition to these things, um, the Southern Negro Youth Congress also had some interesting stuff going on in Louisiana and in Florida. Um, here's one example. 
Um, this is a voting rights rally that occurred. Let's see my notes here. In 1943 in New Orleans, that's Lou Burnham who's speaking, who becomes one of the key organizers of the Columbia Conference in 1946. He was born in Barbados, um, but raised in Harlem and was a key SNYC activist. Um, I should say that um, my book focuses on the SNYC in Richmond, South Carolina, Columbia Conference, as well as a little bit in Alabama. But there's so much more to do on this. Um, there are file folders and boxes at um, the archives at Howard um, that are really untapped. And I would love for other historians to come along and look at these other councils. What, was, what were they doing in Florida? What were they doing in Georgia, Tennessee, et cetera? We still don't have a complete picture. Um, but what I will say is that the SNYC does a lot of interesting work too, come wartime during World War II in Alabama. And in Alabama, they form these youth centers. And here's a photograph of one of the youth centers. Um, they formed four of them around the Birmingham area. And you say to yourself, oh, youth centers, this is a very innocuous thing to do. This doesn't seem very radical. And in some ways it wasn't, but in other ways it absolutely was. These youth centers became incubators for young people around the Birmingham area to become activists. They were art contests, they were taught African-American history um, and activism stemmed out of these youth centers, including Mildred Mac McAdory. Mildred McAdory is not someone you'll probably read about in your history books, but she ran the Fairfield, Alabama Youth Center for the SNYC. During the war, she was arrested and beaten for defying segregation on a bus. Um, well before Rosa Parks, right? Here she is um, in jail by defying Jim Crow on a bus um, coming home from the youth center. Another person on the staff that was instrumental was Sally Davis. Sally Davis was um, running one of the other youth centers. Um, and of course, her young daughter, Angela Davis, got her first experiences as an activist, as a young girl hanging out at these youth centers during the Second World War. Um, the SNYC during World War II fights a really broad campaign against police brutality in the area of um, Birmingham. They take up the case of Ressy Taylor, which of course is now a very well-known case about rape. Um, and by the end of the war, this activism develops even further into a DC campaign by the SNYC to oust Bilbo. So they all go to Washington DC and start protesting the idea that Senator Bilbo from Mississippi gets to represent the state of Mississippi, yet only 1% of eligible voters actually vote for his election, right? So this was, as these signs suggest, Bilbo is the symbol of fascism, the enemy of democracy, inspire, inspirer of lynch terror and traitor to peace. So coming out of the war, the SNYC couldn't be more optimistic about the post-war era. They really felt like the anti-fascist alliance of the late 30s and again renewed during World War II with the Soviet Union built a powerful worldwide group of workers who, was going to, who were going to beat back fascism in America as well as around the world um, once the war ended. And so they're engaging in all kinds of new forms of activism. Um, and the Committee on DC Affairs um, is really active against um, Bilbo and other white supremacist Southern representatives. Um, and of course, one month before the Columbia Conference that I'll talk about in detail in just a minute, you get um, activists descending on DC for another reason which is the crusade to end lynching led by Paul Robeson. Lots of SNYC members are part of this crusade. 3000 people protest at the Lincoln Memorial and cause quite a stir. Um, lots of international press um, at this protest trying to force Truman to actually endorse a robust civil rights agenda. And even Albert Einstein signed on to the crusade to end lynching. So it was a powerful group of people at the end of the war who were pushing 
to really um, kill Jim Crow in all of its different forms. But nowhere was that more apparent than the state of South Carolina. And the reasons for that are quite complicated. Um, South Carolina had not actually had a robust SNYC council until after World War II. And it was largely um, three people who I'm sure whose names you all know, um, Majeska Simpkins and um, John McRae and Ossie McCain who welcomed and recruited the SNYC to come into South Carolina. Simpkins, I know, I'm sure you all know her history. McRae, of course, famously starts publishing The Lighthouse and Informer, which is a wonderful uh, African-American radical newspaper out of Columbia. Um, and he moves to Columbia in the late 1930s. And McCain, I think, is perhaps the most important of these three in terms of courting young people. Um, McCain, of course, had lots of international experience. He was a war veteran from World War I. Um, he had moved permanently to get Belgium between World War I and World War II. He operated a jazz club there. And so he was very familiar with um, international ideas about race and anti-colonialism, et cetera. Um, but he comes back to South Carolina, his home state, um, just before the war breaks out because the Nazis are invading Belgium. So as a result, you get these three older activists who are courting young activists to come into South Carolina. And they already are veterans of a significant movement in South Carolina, the Progressive Democratic Party that I'm guessing all of you have heard about to some degree. Have you, have you all talked about the Progressive Democratic Party yet? Yes. Yes, okay. So I don't need to repeat that, but it's quite a remarkable um, event when they organize their own Democratic Party, um, show up at the Chicago 1944 Democratic Convention and try to get seated rather than the all white um, party that was, they claim was illegally um, you know, voted as delegates to the convention. They're not able to get seated, but I think it's super significant that they and a number of other African-Americans are able to push J James Burns from South Carolina out of the possible nomination for vice president. So Harry Truman becomes the new vice president rather than James Burns, which is something of a victory. Um, so the SNYC comes into South Carolina and there's a great optimism around moving in the South, um, starting a mass-based movement, but there's also, of course, a lot of indignation. And one of the, the episodes of indignation is of course the famous beating of Sergeant Isaac Woodard in Batesburg, South Carolina, just a few months before the SNYC convention in February of 1946. This became so famous, in fact, that even Harry Truman was outraged by the fact that this guy was taken off a bus, beaten, blinded, and, and left for dead. Um, this made SNYC activists all the more uh, sort of determined to set up shop in South Carolina. And so they hold a school, a leadership training school in Irmo at Harbison Junior College, as Brett mentioned, um, in August of 1946, where they bring in young Black Southern activists from around the South, and they train them in a whole variety of activist techniques but also in black history. Um, they also give them all kinds of training in um, international race relations, et cetera. And it becomes a very successful incubator for what's coming in South Carolina with the major conference. Um, meantime, I should say one other contextual thing that's going on at the same moment right before the conference in South Carolina of October, 1946, is the NNC petitions the United Nations on behalf of the oppressed African Americans within the United States. This is the first ever petition to the newly formed UN um, taking civil rights and putting it on the international stage as a human rights violation. For various reasons, that petition doesn't get shelved, mostly due to the um, uh, 
sort of uh, snuffing out by Eleanor Roosevelt, who is promoted as the head of the Human Rights Commission of the newly formed UN. But it sends a signal around the world that the new kind of generative civil rights movement in America is actually an international movement. And that was definitely the theme in South Carolina. The theme being that um, here are these grassroots activists in the South, but they're looking at the world through an international lens and an anti-fascist lens. Um, many of them had had experience in World War II in the SNYC, um, had joined the armed forces like James Jackson, who was in Burma, um, Ed Strong and others um, had all served. And this gave them key international experience to come home fighting. Um, veterans were marching in places like Birmingham, Alabama, um, organized by the SNYC. And um, they brought a lot of their energy to South Carolina to organize this massive legislature where they would have hold a mock legislature to show America and the world what anti-racist democracy actually looked like. And so this was really powerful that they brought hundreds of young delegates to Columbia, South Carolina um, for the youth legislature in late October. And it became one of the most remarkable conferences that SNYC had ever held. Um, they had Du Bois there as a speaker, which is actually the title of my lecture is called Behold the Land, which of course is the title of the lecture that Du Bois gave when he addressed the young people at the Southern Negro Youth Congress. And his point was this idea of optimism and that young people should no longer move from the South to the North to engage in activism, but should behold the land and that a mass movement among African-Americans should develop in the post-war South to fight against fascism, um, to um, look at themselves as part of this international struggle. Um, it's one of Du Bois' most um, prophetic speeches. Um, and if you have a chance to study it and to read it for yourself, I really highly recommend it. Um, this image that I've got before you is an image by Charles White, who was a famous African-American artist from Chicago, um, who drew the image for the pamphlet that was sold at the youth legislature of the speech, but also around South Carolina. And then when James Jackson and Esther Cooper Jackson tour around the state and um, Howard Herbert Apthecker tours black colleges, they sell this pamphlet of Du Bois' speech. But I think what's really unique also about the youth legislature in South Carolina is they're specifically trying to develop a, a usable past. What they're doing in South Carolina is saying, we need a post-World War II racial reconstruction, like the reconstruction that occurred in the 1860s and 1870s. It's not a coincidence that Du Bois in 1935 published the famous rebuttal um, to the Dunning School, right? Black Reconstruction in America. SNYC activists had read this book carefully and they saw themselves as the generation and the inheritors of this militant legacy that were going to bring back the kind of militancy of Black Reconstruction. And so when visitors entered the township auditorium at the youth legislature, the SNYC had put up banners of all of the African-American congressmen and senators who had served from the South during Reconstruction, which amazed some of the young people. Jack O'Dell as a teenager attended this conference. Jack O'Dell would go on to be one of the most significant black intellectuals and activists of the 20th century. Um, and he said he was amazed that he had never even known that this history had existed, that black representatives had been from the South and had been elected by interracial democratic means in the 1860s and 1870s. And so after the proceedings began, what they did was they held this mock legislature where they passed all kinds of policies and legislation for the post-war world that would ensure an end to Jim Crow and expand American democracy. Um, 
They also passed around copies of a recent book by a white leftist named Howard Fast. Howard Fast had written a book called Freedom Road that was about reconstruction and its demise. It was a novel um, that was quite popular at the time. And Southern Negro Youth Congress activists sold um, mass market paperback copies of this to raise money, but to also get the message out about the true history of reconstruction. Paul Robeson also came to the conference, sang several amazing songs as he was known to do, but also gave a very fiery speech to the young people assembled there, telling them that a mass movement was necessary to end lynching, to end police brutality, to expand voting rights, and to end fascism in the South. Um, it was remarkable how much energy came out of this conference. And it embarrassed James Burns, who at this time was Secretary of State, trying to negotiate the early outcome of the Cold War, right? What became the Cold War was what was happening in this very moment. The SNYC did not think the Cold War was inevitable. They thought increased hostility would only cause more war and more possible nuclear annihilation. Um, what they wanted was what Henry Wallace wanted, which was um, a peaceful transition and working class people around the world to unite. Um, out of this conference comes a lot of international press, publicity, et cetera, but also local activism, which was really cool. Um, you know, Monk's Corner, Anderson, these places in South Carolina that had uh, small SNYC councils started fighting for things like better busing for their kids, um, engaging in things like Jim Crow Sunday, where they refused to participate in leisure activities that were Jim Crow in South Carolina, etc. And so there was a lot of optimism and a lot of um, significance in this moment of October 1946. But of course, as we all know, that moment wouldn't last very much longer. The federal government starts cracking down um, as the Cold War begins. Repression of the SNYC is fast and severe, where you have the federal government, um, you know, at telling that the, you know, listing the SNYC as a, a radical organization. Um, and as a result, they, um, you know, basically get abandoned by liberals, right? Um, they get abandoned by the CIO who's organizing tobacco workers in South Carolina, um, which they could have been a great help for their organizing drive. Um, and the repression is swift to the point where by the time SNYC holds its last conference in Birmingham in 1948, they really get swept out of the city by a young police chief by the name of Bull Connor. So, why study the SNYC? Why, why is this so interesting to me? And I hope interesting to you as well. Um, the SNYC obviously did not serve a death blow to Jim Crow, but what they did do was really remarkable. And that history should not be lost. Um, they had a very working class based understanding of anti-racism and of activism. And they did remarkable things in the late 1930s, all the way up until 1948, when the organization fell apart. They also pushed liberals to endorse a civil rights agenda. So while they're being blacklisted and pushed off the stage of viable leadership and thrown in jail, et cetera, um, Truman issues a report and a committee on civil rights, right? And this becomes a kind of blueprint for the liberal civil rights movement. And if you get a chance to read it, it's very interesting. Um, one of the reasons they give for civil rights is the moral reason. Another reason is the international reason. And many of these things are co-opted versions of the agenda of the SNYC in South Carolina. Not as radical, but still, the radicalism of the SNYC is putting this kind of anti-racist agenda onto the national stage that can't be ignored anymore. And so Truman can't ignore it, but then moving forward, of course, um, national politicians can't ignore it when the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s emerges after the demise of this movement. And I would say also, you know, when you think about the remarkable things the SNYC did, it's not like they disappeared. 
these people became activists for life. And it's really significant when you look through their documents and how much amazing um, effort went into their activism and their intellectual pursuits and also their social pursuits. This is a wonderful photograph of the dance at the SNY, after the SNYC conference in Columbia in um, October, 1946, that actually having attended this anniversary that Brett mentioned, um, a photographer sent me this photo, or, or sorry, an archivist sent me this photo that I had not known had existed. It just showed the kind of optimism in celebratory moment of 1946, where these activists didn't know that the Cold War was gonna crush a lot of their dreams, a lot of their freedom dreams for the post-war world. But after the demise of SNYC, they do not go away. And I wanna end with this um, slide. Um, this is a famous journal called Freedom Ways that was read by many activists in the 1960s and 1970s and beyond. Um, if you look at who the editors were, this is from the very first edition, Shirley Graham, right? Shirley Graham Du Bois, W. Alphaeus Hunton, who was a very dynamic activist, um, international um, activist, um, Margaret Burroughs, who was a young artist and activist out of Chicago, and Esther Cooper Jackson, who was one of the key Southern Negro Youth Congress organizers. And they recruited other SNYC people as well um, to write for the journal, to train a new generation of activists. So they were behind the scenes of the 1950s and 1960s civil rights movement, but certainly not forgotten. And here is a portrait of a later version of Freedom Ways on the other slide, which of course is of Angela Davis, who is the daughter of Sally Davis of the Southern Negro Youth Congress and who becomes a formidable activist in her own right. So even though the, the organization was killed, their political agenda, the culture they created was harder to quash. And I think underneath the black freedom struggle of the 50s, 60s, you see all kinds of connections between the Southern Negro Youth Congress and SNCC and between other young people um, in the movement of that period as well. So I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, I feel like I've talked at you enough and I really look forward to just having a discussion about this period, um, about the activism of the 30s and 40s and specific to South Carolina or any other questions you might have um, about um, these activists from a previous generation. So thanks for listening. Well, first off, thanks so much, Dr. Gamma, for another great presentation. Uh, and I, I couldn't help, please give a round of applause. Uh, that was wonderful. And I, I couldn't help, as you were mentioning Freedom Ways, I actually had to get out my Freedom Ways reader that I had just behind me in my bookshelf. Um, and also the fact that it was funny that you mentioned Angela Davis because she's actually coming to Columbia to speak this Thursday. So oh my gosh. Uh, the, timing, <laughs> the timing of your talk could not have been better. So who's um, going to ask her about the Southern Negro Youth Congress and her earliest memories, right? Yes, I love it. I bet <laughs> so you she what, doesn't often get asked that question. I, I, I would put good money on that. I, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Um, so uh, let's go ahead. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Brett, did you have anything you wanted to add while we wait for questions? To, while to we in? wait for questions, I want to lift up the fact that we're going to come back next week and pick up the, the brutality of the smashing of the militant movement and the heart of that evil being Jimmy Burns. Uh, and we'll tie that all together next, next time. But the, uh, I saw that Dr. Green put uh, Behold the Land um, in the chat. And that's, we'll, we'll post that. That's in part of the next reading. We have a copy that you can download. Oh, great. He calls he calls South Carolina and the South the firing line of change. Yeah. <laughs> this is where that the, the radical action is more likely to happen, uh, and that um, it's just a really very powerful um, statement that is I've read that it was one of the ten greatest speeches ever given in America, but that um, the uh, the militant nature of the movement people get confused as like violent. No, it's like authoritative. It's like 
we're not asking you to do us a favor. We're claiming our rights as citizens of this country that you're saying that we have our human rights, not our civil rights. And that That's distinction right. between human rights and civil rights becomes real clear, as Majeska would explain. Civil rights are what they can grant you and take away. Human rights are what you come with and they can't take them from you. Mm. And so th that, um, the Red Scare, we'll get into this a lot next week, but the Red Scare made it uncomfortable for a lot of people to continue on that path of, the, of demanding full rights. And uh, the, the difference between say that uh, what we'd seen prior to that with um, the uh, SMRC and the CIO working together in a multiracial front, the multiracial fronts broke down uh, and the Red Scare was, was brutal. I mean, put people in jail, ran people out of the country, ruined people's careers, got Majeska thrown out of the NAACP state conference she started. Yeah. And so that was the domestication, which I, I give Eric the, the credit for putting that term in my head about the domestication of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Dr. Green, take questions. All right, so we are already getting some questions in the chat. And, and by the way, for those who are interested in seeing Angela Davis, I put a link to that in the chat as well. You do want to go register for that as quickly as you can because spots are already filling up. Um, now, Greg Howell has, I think, an excellent question. Um, what role did the Communist Party play in supporting the Southern Negro Youth Congress? That's a great question. Um, and it's a complicated one. Um, certainly, I would say many of the core activists in the Southern Negro Youth Congress um, were either communists or became communists. But there are also many members and leaders in the SNYC who were not communists, but were willing to work with communists. So, um, you know, they were young African Americans who had um, a very left leaning perspective. Um, they saw communism as an important alternative to capitalism and the depression. Um, but what I should also say is joining the Communist Party in the late 1930s was not what it was made out to be in the 1950s, meaning that some Southern Negro Youth Congress activists nonchalantly joined the Communist Party. They were at a meeting one day, they were fellow workers, and, they, and someone said, hey, do you want to join the Communist Party? And they said, sure, right? Um, it wasn't what it became later with McCarthyism, of, were you or were you not a communist, right? That kind of stuff. Um, it was much more of a ambiguous kind of, um, people were going in and out of these left-wing circles in the, in the late 30s and into the war era. Now, in terms of influence on the Southern Negro Youth Congress, I would say the Communist Party has an indirect influence. Um, for example, uh, in my book, I talk about some passages that from a couple of speeches by Esther Cooper Jackson during World War II, where she's calling for some radical changes. Those passages were crossed out. And I think it was largely kind of censorship by the larger CP or someone in the CP saw a version of the speech and decided that certain things weren't in line with the Communist Party's priority to win the war and to sort of clamp down on protest at home during World War II in support of the Soviet Union. So there was kind of stuff like that that happened. But in terms of like the ideological whiplash that occurred between 1939 and 1941 with the Communist Party, you know, signing the non-aggression pact, Stalin's pact with Hitler, all of a sudden overnight, you know, the popular front is done. Um, you know, all communists are supposed to say, stay out of World War II, it's an imperialist war, which had some truth to it. Um, but then of course, when Hitler breaks the, the, the non-aggression pact and invades the Soviet Union, overnight in 1941, the communist party goes right back to anti-fascism, enter the war now, we must exterminate or get rid of all forms of fascism around the world. Now that was very complicated if you were a young black communist. Fortunately, a lot of Southern Negro Youth Congress activists were indir so indirectly shielded from some of the larger issues and, and sort of partisanship in the Communist Party that they had a lot more latitude to get away with um, not necessarily obeying every rule of the Communist Party um, you know, 
there are a lot of black communist leaders in New York who really like to lay down the law about what the policy is and what the line is and et cetera. But if you were doing activism in South Carolina or Alabama or Richmond, you really didn't have to pay much attention to that as much as someone in New York City had to pay attention to it. So there was a lot of latitude. And I'll end, by, end that question by answering um, you know, a question I posed directly to Esther Cooper Jackson, which is why like, if the Communist Party had all of these problems and you know, um, was sometimes compromised the Black freedom struggle, why did you stay in it? And she said, why would I leave it? Leaving it would be a surrender. I wanted to be inside of it and I wanted to change it and transform it because it was the best vehicle possible for liberation, right? And so that was her attitude. Other people had a different attitude and they, you know, for various reasons left the Communist Party, um, but stayed as left-wing activists and civil rights activists. So I hope that helps answer your question. It's, it's a very complicated question. Um, in many ways, I feel like without the Communist Party, the Southern Negro Youth Congress never would have gotten off the ground in the way it did. But in other ways, I feel like the Communist Party by the late 40s became the kind of Achilles heel of the Southern Negro Youth Congress, because as these organizers were being red baited and repressed, the CP went into a new direction that was very um, hierarchical, radical, and sectarian. All right, the two really dominant characters in the, the 46th conference with Esther, Esther Cooper, I don't think she was married to Mr. Jackson at the time, and Dorothy Barnum. And they were in their 20s. And so it was just so dynamic, especially for young people today, young people of color today, to see these, these young women leading with uh, really uh, very, very clearly in an articulate and militant fashion, um, predicated on a, a political social philosophy. And I think that the distinction between seeing, using the term of communism as an economic theory versus seeing the, the way that the, 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 red, the red scare people wanted to see it is you are a friend of the Soviet Union, you're a tool of a foreign power. Mm -hmm. No, I'm actually just liking the, the concept of the economic distribution of wealth that you people have. And so being able to turn it into a, 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 a foreign, support of a foreign government was what really strengthened the ability of the Red Scare to destroy people's lives. And Majeska, when asked if she was a communist, her famous response was, no, I, I never have been, but if they're doing all those good things you say they are, maybe I should be. <laughs> and we've got Becky's book that every all the students should have one, and there are some at the building, and if, we'll, we'll mail one to everybody that hadn't gotten one yet. But uh, History Denied is her booklet that focuses on the Southern Negro Youth Congress and the, the, the 48 conference in Birmingham, which can't be left out. And other than Angela Davis's mother being at the conference, Julian Bond's father was there with a young Julian. Mm. And uh, of course, Jack O'Dell. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one of those places where I wish I could, historically speaking, been a fly on the wall. Uh, and I'm going to curse Eric because now I'm looking for my Freedom Ways reader. I'm like, I might have to read this the rest of the evening if even I have like, work to do. But Oh, you know what? I have something for all of you that is a huge um, innovation. Um, let me just find it as uh, we're getting to the next question. But I'm going to drop something in the chat if I can um, that I just found out about last week. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it's not working. Hold on. Uh, uh, here it is. Um, as far as I know, this just came out last week, and it is the complete free digitization of every That's issue right. of Freedom Ways. And you can download every issue onto <laughs> your computer. It's free. It's open access. That's via JSTOR, correct? Yeah. So the yeah. link there is, is your gateway, and you can organize it by date. Um, that the legacy of the of the articles of Freedom Ways is 
a PhD in, in activism and um, the black freedom struggle. I mean, it is so good. The content and quality of that, of that journal is just incredible. Definitely. Definitely. I, I think uh, I'm going to re-put the link in the chat. I, I'm not seeing it on my end. Um, oh, you know what? It's because I just direct message to... Yeah, that's the thing about Zoom. It, it just <laughs> plays havoc with DMs. Gene has oh. it, but no one else got it. <laughs> Here it is. Excellent. Okay. Uh, now, while folks take a look at that, and again, I encourage you to, because I also use it as a resource for my research as well, and I encourage my students to collapse and do the same. Uh, here is Donna Jones' question, and I think this harkens back to something that you and Bert were talking about a moment ago. I am curious about the use of the word militant and how that is defined as an approach. Mm. Yeah, um, so that word kept coming up in the NNC papers, um, and then you know, militant can be, um, yeah, I realize it can be a little confusing, mean like military style or like using guns or something like that. But I think what they were referring to is militancy as in like speeding up the sort of pace of demands, um, engaging in a much more radical set of activist tools like marching in the streets, strikes, boycotts, um, these kind of activist things that we take for granted today, but in the 1930s, those kinds of tools were not yet respectable by any means, right? Like the NAACP would have shied away from those kinds of ideas and those kinds of um, sort of uh, forms of protest politics. And so they're trying to make more militant the civil rights movement to make it um, more of a, you know, a uh, series of radical demands than a kind of passive negotiation. There's another measure of the difference between, say, militants and liberalism uh, that a lib uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the radical is looking for the to to call to to deal with the cause of the problem. The liberals will stop at trying to mitigate the damage of the problem. That's what we see with like the soft, you know, the soft ne neoliberalism of the Democratic Party that's actually just a, 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 a smarter version of predatory capitalism. Mm. The liberal will, will grease the knife they use to cut your throat with, as an old IWW saying. But if you think of someone that is militant as being someone that is going to, to demand you stop making people hungry as opposed to give them food. It's like you, you go after the cause of hunger as opposed to give people food. There's a difference between the type of radical social work and social service work. Not, not throwing shade on social service work. It's good if you have a strategy with it to get beyond the, uh, the uh, just doing the so service and getting into the cause of it. But uh, Simpkins, and also there's a, will, uh, there's a willingness to make people uncomfortable. Mm. Yeah. Simpkins made people very uncomfortable. Yep, and to break through um, civility, right? as a means that, that was used to manage race relations, which covered over great inequalities, right? Now, speaking of which, there is another uh, comment in the chat, which I think, again, links back to the chapter five reading uh, from your book that we also have for this week. Mm -hmm. And this is again from Greg. He says, uh, I'm reading Many Are the Crime, McCarthyism in America, and it credits the Communist Party in the United States for promoting black acceptance in the union movement. I previously wasn't aware of the role the communist party played in the CIO in a positive way. Mm. Yeah, um, that's a great comment. And I love that book, Many Are the Crimes. I think it's one of the better books about McCarthyism. Um, I mean, absolutely the communist party plays a role in um, not just getting whites to accept a kind of interracial labor movement within the CIO, but getting African Americans to believe in the CIO and industrial unions. So, for example, like, you know, the Communist Party's defense of the Scottsboro Boys in Alabama, um, the early work that the Communist Party did in the early 1930s 
with anti-eviction struggles and unemployment councils. It became quite common in American cities when you were getting evicted from your apartment to say, quick, go get the reds, get, go get those commies, right? It wasn't that you knew what they were talking about, but you knew that they were the people who showed up and who were determined to help you, right? And that impressed a lot of working class people in black communities in the early 1930s. So by the time you get to the mid 1930s and the formation of the National Negro Congress, you get these African-American labor organizers going in on steel packing houses, automobile plants, and successfully organizing um, black workers and turning black communities from being opposed to unionism to being very much in favor of industrial unionism, which took a lot of effort, right? A lot of ministers got donations from major industrialists or um, a lot of black community members were suspicious of unions because they had been so racist. I mean, the, the whole history of unionization up to the mid 1930s was about exclusion of black workers in many ways, right? So you had to break through. And I think in many ways, the communist party um, did so by showing black communities that these activists were gonna show up, they were for real and they were to be trusted. Now, the next question points more toward white responses to what you're talking about in your book. Uh, with large groups of young blacks congregating, was there no violence at the gatherings by the white opposition, whether by the police, the KKK, were there protests in downtown venues against the presence of the SNYC or other groups like that? Yeah, um, there were, but surprisingly not quite as much as you would think, um, given their um, radical tactics and their um, sort of um, way of organizing. Um, certainly in 1948 at their last conference, um, you know, Bull Connor violently breaks up the conference um, and um, many people go to jail. Um, but I can't think of too many other of egregious examples. I mean, they come, they come to the support of a lot of Af African Americans in the South um, who uh, are the victims of racial violence. Um, you know, like uh, the Ingram case in the, in the immediate post-war era, um, other cases. Um, there is one example in Richmond that's quite fascinating where in the, in the height, at the height of the organizing of tobacco workers by the SNYC, Joe Le Lewis wins a title bout. And I think this is like 38. And black Richmonders are celebrating in the streets with great joy. And some white guy gets in the car and mows down a big crowd of African-Americans and it starts a brawl. And of course the Richmond white press calls it a riot by you know, um, unruly African-Americans. But of course it was this white guy who drove through a crowd of people who provoked the uh, violence, right? Um, but what was interesting about that violence that day in Richmond is that the black African-Americans did not back down. You know, they were throwing some punches too and they got away with it, right? Um, which shows that like, the power structure of Richmond in the late 30s with the tobacco worker organizing and other things was really up for grabs or was like definitely shaking um, to a great degree. But yeah, I mean, you know, in interviewing some of these people before they passed away, like Thelma Dale or Esther Cooper Jackson, they would express amazement to me that there were situations they were in where they just narrowly would escape, you know, a lynch mob or something that would show up like the next day. Um, because the kind of stuff they were doing was just so, um, you know, the exact opposite of what the white supremacists um, wanted African Americans to be doing in the South. That's a great question, though. Dr. Gilman, I I have perhaps romanticized the the um, reason that the Forty Six Conference was located in Columbia. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna <clears throat> see if, if this sounds true to you that we, at that point, South Carolina was the only state 
that were still having a close uh, a white only primary. They'd shut down Texas. They'd shut down Georgia. The Elmore v. Rice uh, suit was in play, and it was becoming an international issue of the last place that was would not let black people participate in the government. And then you had the Isaac Woodard case in February of that year that became a international cause celeb when um, um, uh, uh, the, the movie star who had the radio show, uh, Orson Welles. Orson Welles did a series of four different uh, series of interviews, not interviews, the actual program mm. about the blinding and he was outraged. Mm. And so there was a, a fundraiser in New York City in April of that year. Uh, 36,000 people turned out with all the A-listers, uh, Billy Holiday, Milton Berle, and Cab Calloway. And so there was, a, there was more of an international focus in Colombia, and there was also a huge crowd. And so I'm just wondering if there was some, some of the momentum was what kept some of the lid on. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right in terms of, you mean in terms of why there wasn't a, a white supremacist response during that weekend? Yeah, and there were, there were, from what I've read, depending on whose numbers you use, 3,000 to 5,000 people there. The place holds yeah. 3,200. I've right. heard there were people outside with, you know, speakers. There were 400 and something delegates from South Carolina, 175 white delegates. Mm -hmm. so it was, I think it shocked a lot of people and they kind of stepped back and they took a lot of notes because we've seen the FBI. Right. right. And, you know, there is a lot of national and international press attention yeah. And so, you know, engaging in violence at this moment was probably not something that- And it, it, was, it was very politely done. I mean, they, you know, they danced, Paul Robeson sang, they talked and they went home. Right. <laughs> I mean, like I was trying to describe, you know, that, like that famous activist saying, this is what democracy looks like. Uh, That's what the whole conference was. It was a mock legislator say, here is what interracial democracy in the U.S. looks like. What, did you know, I don't know if I ever mentioned to you that when we did that, that um, 2016 70th anniversary, the, the, the building that they had that in in, in, in uh, 46 belongs to the county. It still belongs to the county. Nobody that worked there knew that it happened. Nobody on county council knew that would happen. And it was, it's just so amazing that something that, that profound got that erased. Yeah, and I'm like, I might be misremembering here, but I remember like vaguely some letter that Lou Burnham wrote right before the conference where he was saying like, I can't believe we got a permit to hold our conference here. It was almost like they had no idea what that Southern Negro Youth Congress was because they weren't really well known in South Carolina. But like, you know, if they had tried to do the same thing in Birmingham at some county auditorium, there is no way they would have been issued a permit to like, hey, come, yeah, <laughs> you know. So okay. I think they kind of got away with one there and snuck in there, you know. And, th and then when it actually happened, people were like, what is this, right? Who are all these people? Paul Robeson and, um, you know. Uh, well, I'm, and I'm not sure all our students tonight know that it was illegal for black and white people to be at the same event in the township, like on the same floor, right. and they were. Yeah. And so the, the whole event was, was pretty awesome. Indeed. I'm still getting over the idea of folks in Columbia suddenly hearing that Paul Robeson's in town and the massive <laughs> freak out that must have been in amongst white Colombians about that. On that note, um, let me get to Joseph Tolliver's excellent question. Uh, can you comment on the students who attended the third leadership training session in Columbia? Oh, gosh. Um, one of them was Annabelle Weston, who became um, a key um, South Carolina activist for SNYC. Um, maybe Rosa Mae Catchings was there too, who became a really interesting activist out of South Carolina, um, gets involved with the anti-apartheid movement later in life. Um, they were from all over the South. Um, one interesting project would be, I mean, I know I have somewhere the list of participants, to like track each each of those people and like what became of each of these young people, right? I'm sure they all didn't become lifelong activists, but um, it'd be interesting to know what, you know, to try to figure out where they all went and what they all did after leaving Irmo. Um, but certainly there were a few of them anyway that did go on to 
the key activists in Southern Negro Youth Congress. I recently, I recently found out that the Howard Archives has the applications from a number. There were, I believe, 11 chapters that Majeska helped start in South Carolina. Yeah. I don't know how many of those people participated. And there were two schools that I know of, the one at Harvest and one at Allen University. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I want the, the students to do, this is a great opportunity to go forth and do a, some type of practical, go to Monk's Corner. Look up the papers, see who you can find anybody that's still alive that had relatives there. The, the, the program for the 46th conference, um, Bobby Donaldson got a really nice copy and I was showing it to people whose father or grandfather, I can't remember, store was advertised in, in the program and they didn't even know about it. And so the, it would just be, I think, exciting sleuth work to go to these towns that um, lost a lot of momentum that their folks had built up. 70 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And of course, one of the treats of that Columbia um, celebration a few years ago was meeting Abby Wilson, who was the young man who actually handed the gavel that had wood from the first slave ship that came to the shores of South Carolina to Du Bois at the conference, right? And he was still alive and well and had a very sharp memory and was telling me all about the lighthouse informer and John McRae and all this stuff. And I was just like, wow. I mean, you know, I, I, it's amazing that, you know, people like him were still around. I think that's also a reminder of how many great stories there are of activism in this state that still are waiting to be told. Oh yeah. Uh, because they haven't, <clears throat> because they just haven't been, people haven't talked to them. They just got to talk to people sometimes and learn these things. Uh, which actually brings me to the next question. Um, this is from Don Murphy. What factors and or experiences drew you to study this particular topic? Oh, wow. Um, I had a great undergraduate advisor who was writing a biography of John P. Davis, and he always kept me at arm's length from that project and was like not talking to me about it. <laughs> he never published it as a book. It's a dissertation um, from Cornell. Um, John P. Davis was the head of the National Negro Congress. I think it was when I got to grad school, I, the more I looked into 1930s activism, the more I was just unsatisfied with the kind of explanations that other historians had given about it. There were a couple of historians though, who really inspired me. And one of them is very obvious, which is Robin Kelly's first book, Hammer and Ho, that has actually a chapter or more about the Southern Negro Youth Congress in the midst of the Black Alabama communist movement um, in the late 1930s. And he was actually quite friendly with Lou Burnham, Dorothy Burnham, Esther Cooper Jackson, James Jackson, um, and others um, from the Southern Negro Youth Congress and got to interview them you know, way before I did. Um, and so that was really inspirational. And then, you know, I started going through the microfilm reels of the Southern Negro Youth Congress, or sorry, the NNC and the um, papers at the Schomburg in New York City. And the more I looked into this, the more I was just like, how could this history not exist? How could it have been wiped away, you know, by the next generation, not just McCarthyites, but, you know, the very people who were, who were involved in this activism, um, hid their past, you know, um, burned their papers, didn't talk about what they did back in the 40s, you know. Um, there were some that continued on in really remarkable ways, like Esther Cooper with Freedom Ways and stuff, but others who, you know, were blacklisted and were put in jail and um, then tried to move on with their lives after the fact um, and sort of hid this um, history that um, really, to me, I think, said new and interesting things, not just about the 30s and 40s, but about the traditional civil rights movement that um, you know, had become much more famous in the literature and much more famous in popular memory. Now, Baba Derek Jackson has a good question as well. Um, he asked, <clears throat> what was it about the South that Du Bois saw where some of the most progressive Blacks would come from the Southern region of the country in the, the course of the 20th century. And I think this is again, harkening back to the Behold the Land speech and yeah. what Du Bois says there. 
I mean, Du Bois hadn't always thought that, right? Um, you know, going back to the turn of the century, I think he would have largely been like, well, I think African Americans should come to the North and take advantage of more freedom and opportunity there. And, um, you know, I think he really comes around to this in the 40s. Um, he starts hanging out with young activists like the Jacksons and the Burnhams and the Strongs and um, really gets influenced by them. Um, Du Bois' own politics start developing too, right? He's becoming much more radical. And then of course, after this 46 moment, he becomes a communist and goes to Africa, right? Um, so he's radicalizing, um, he's seeing the South as uh, having the possibility for a mass movement. And I think this comes out of a lot of his writings too about sort of the African-American folk, you know, working class people who had the propensity for great um, resistance and real sort of um, religious based, but other, other, other based um, forms of kind of activism. Um, and so he's, he came around to the idea by 46 that the South really should be the battleground and that African-Americans should stop migrating to the North to flee the South, but stand their ground and really try to get democracy back. And um, I think he had a real case to make too about the land itself, right? The, the, the land part of behold the land. We're the ones who toiled on this land for hundreds of years enslaved. Why should we abandon it, right? We should stake our own claim to this. This is our place, right? And I think that was a really powerful message. Now, um, before I, I see a couple of comments in the chat, before we get to those, I just I have a question as well. Um, I just want to ask about the reading and your larger work here. Sure. So in, in the chapter, you mentioned um, a book called, I believe it's called Freedom Road uh, oh, yeah. about the Reconstruction Era. Could you talk a bit about that? Because I, I know the book best as the TV movie was made into back in the 70s, <laughs> story Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Um, so could you talk a bit about the book and, and how people felt about that novel back in the 1940s? Sure. Um, so the book was written by a very famous white leftist named Howard Fast. Um, and it was an attempt to popularize Du Bois's revisionist history of Black Reconstruction, right? especially the idea that um, Reconstruction didn't fail because African-Americans failed. Reconstruction failed because African-Americans were succeeding so much that white supremacy tore it down to make it fail, right? So this reinterpretation is sort of the plot of the novel. It follows this main character named Gideon who owns a plot of land and is very successful as a black independent farmer during Reconstruction. But all of that comes crashing down when white supremacists take away his land. And there's this great line at the end of the novel too, where it said not only was Gideon, you know, uh, in his wealth extracted, but the very memory of this period was expunged from history, right? And so Fast was trying to popularize, I think that the very academic book of Black Reconstruction by Du Bois, put it out there for um, a leftist audience and probably a white leftist audience, right? These allies on the left. But National Negro Congress and Southern Negro Youth Congress folks embraced this novel because it was the very kind of history and story that they wanted to get out there about reconstruction in order to legitimize their own desire for a new reconstruction in 45, 46, and 47. And so it, they sold copies, um, they got special priced mass market copies of the book and sold it up and down the West Coast in California, Revels Caton, the grandson of Hiram Revels, the first black senator from Mississippi was the head of the National Negro Congress at the time. He's touring California with Paul Robeson and they're selling copies of Freedom Road. <laughs> so it's all of this cultural stuff combined, right? Um, which reminds me, can I go on a tangent for just one minute? I forgot to show you all something. Please go ahead. I decided to take this artifact out and, and there's a little show and tell. I don't know if you can see it. 
This is another artifact of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. It's um, 378 records that were produced in 1941. Um, and it's Josh White, the famous blues musician, who was a member of the National Negro Congress with a young poet named Warren Cooney, who was a member of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. So the music is Josh White's music. The lyrics are Warren Cooney's lyrics and the liner notes to this are by Richard Wright. This came out in 1941. And it's some of the most political music Josh White ever wrote. It's all about Jim Crow blues, you know, um, you know, Richard Wright in the liner notes had this amazing quote. Let me see if I can find it, where he says, um, he says, these aren't the blues, these are the fighting blues, right? Meaning that this music was meant to stir you up. It wasn't meant to, you know, drown in your sorrows, but to, um, you know, activate you, energize you. Um, and uh, it's really some of the best music Josh White ever recorded. Um, anyway, so that's just, this is just one other artifact from this history that I thought was really cool that I wanted to show you all. That's 78? 378 records in this deluxe sort of package here. If you're ever at a thrift store and you happen upon this thing, grab it right away, okay? <laughs> it's very rare, to, but I don't think a lot of people know that it's very rare, so anyway. Well and I and I had to ask that question because I, I think it's interesting that that novel came out roughly a decade after Gone with the Wind. And we tend to think of this era of history as just being lost causes of left and right. But you have people in the 30s and 40s saying, like the bullets, like like Howard Fast saying, hey, this is not the only story that's out there. In fact, it's not accurate at all. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And you know the kind of culture, the movement culture that they produce is something that I just want to stress, like McCarthyism could not kill that. You can't, you can't kill a movement culture. You can kill the organization, right? But the, that culture continued into that next generation and you can see it you know, in various places. So a couple of, I think, interesting comments in the chat before we get to our next question. Uh, Bob and Derek also points out, New York during the 60s, radicalism was defined as a white movement and militancy was defined as a black movement. He's kind of used as a way to create the vision between the various movements. Hmm. Um, I, I saw that, that Greg also had some interesting comments about, um, <laughs> going back to Orson Welles, who at one point uh, dated Eartha Kitt, and he referred to Eartha Kitt as the most exciting woman in the world, which doesn't surprise me at all. Um, now, yeah. there's another question from Greg, actually. I think a, a really important one here. Uh, putting Orson Welles and Eartha Kitt aside for a moment. Okay. Uh, can you discuss the logistics of organizing such a large conference at the time, uh, the largest human rights conference in the South up until then? How was it financed? What about housing for the thousands of participants uh, and what other venues in Columbia were used besides Allen University and, and the Township Auditorium? Uh, was Benedict used, local churches, et cetera? So there's a lot to, to work with there. But basically, what were the logistics of the conference like? On yeah, the I'd have to go back to all my archival notes to really definitively answer that. But um, to answer the question briefly, like, how was it financed? God, on a shoestring budget. I mean, they were just constantly trying to fundraise in various ways. Um, and no, like the communist party did not give a hundred thousand dollars to the conference. There was no Moscow gold involved. Um, but, uh, I think a couple of unions, like they invited Mike Quill of the transit workers union from New York, who ultimately didn't come, but I'm, I, I think his union gave some money. Um, it's amazing that they put this together. Um, Lou Burnham has this great quote in the chat. I don't know if it's in this chapter or an earlier chapter where he says, the Southern Negro Youth Congress is going as fast as it can, it can because the only resources we have are human resources, <laughs> right? That they're always broke. Um, in fact, the, the funny story about how Esther Cooper joined the, the Southern Negro Youth Congress is that James Jackson met her 
at like one of the first conferences and she had no intention of becoming part of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. She was off to University of Chicago, I believe, for a master's degree where she was going to work, I think, with John Hope. Was John Hope Franklin there yet? Probably not. She was going to go to University of Chicago to do a master's degree. And um, she had just received a Rosenwald Fellowship to do some kind of study that summer. And Jackson, by the time they were done, um, convinced her to give her all of the money for the Rosenwald Fellowship to the Southern Negro Youth Congress instead, and to drop her plans to go to Chicago. And she becomes the Southern Negro Youth Congress leader, organizer, intellectual, um, and of course marries James Jackson um, just before the start of World War II. Um, and they become this dynamic activist couple. But yeah, so I mean, Lou Burnham, um, Majeska Sim Simpkins, Ossie McCain, these are the people who organized, uh, Annabelle Weston, um, they just were working around the clock to try to organize this thing. And um, it was an amazing feat, right, that they organized it and they were able to do so on such a paltry budget. One of the, the things also is that the people you just mentioned, um, I think, we can say now had the, the most together uh, NAACP uh, chapter and branch the, yes. the, in the country. They right. had a newspaper, they had a radio, they did radio shows. And I actually, uh, one of the few Lighthouse Informers I've seen that preceded the conference had a little advertisement for tickets. And I've got the picture somewhere. They were either 50 cents or a dollar. Oh, wow. But, well, That's great. Yeah. And I'm sure that Majeska took money out of Victory Savings Bank when she needed to. Yeah, because her husband was running a pretty successful chain of liquor stores, right? They had they had any their finger in any number of financial endeavors. Yeah, so um, yeah, probably some of their own money went into it, and McRae was probably donating money, whatever he could spare from the White House Informer. And, and <laughs> sorry, my cats are having a fight behind me. Um, yeah, but. Uh, it was not a super well-funded conference, but it's amazing if you have great organizers, right? You can really pull something like that off. Now, here's another question uh, from Donald. I think actually links to what you talked about with activism and how important that kind of uh, movement organizing can mm -hmm. be. Uh, last week, we talked about the continuity of white supremacy through various manifestations utilizing violence and economic oppression. Uh, do you see iterations of youth activism existed today, kind of what you're talking about with the SNYC, or was the heyday of Black youth activism in the 1930s and 40s? Huh. Um, oh, God. I think you've got several generations of Black youth activism that has reshaped this country in really profound ways, right? I mean, when I teach about the 50s and 60s civil rights movement, right? Project C in Birmingham, I mean, it's got middle school kids, right? Um, you know, when the movement broke out in the mid 1950s and you've got the Southern Christian Leadership Conference by like 59, King and his ministers don't really know what to do. There's kind of a lull in the civil rights movement. What's next? What are we gonna do, right? And all of a sudden in Greensboro, four college students sit down at a lunch counter and that spread like wildfire. And it wasn't planned, it just spread. And it was remarkable, right? And out of that comes SNCC. So I would say there are several generations of youth activists who really um, are notable. That 30s, 40s generation for sure, but also the 50s, 60s generation and beyond and, and today. Um, I mean, some of the most um, dramatic activism is going on among young people. And it's not a coincidence, right? I think young people gravitate to activism because they're idealistic, they're young, they're energetic, and they have less to lose, right? And then they drag in their elders who maybe have more to lose, but when they see what's at stake for their young people, they get invested in the movement too, which creates an intergenerational kind of tie there. Um, that's really important. 
So never call young people naive and dumb and never try to lead them, right? Ella Baker was so smart when she told the young SNCC people, don't become a wing of the NAACP, don't become a wing of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, do your own thing, right? Um, because you don't want adults trying to control you and your organization. And Southern Negro Youth Congress was also an example of that. They did their own thing. And I should say what was also remarkable about the core of Southern Negro Youth Congress activists, they lived the lives they believed in too. So they were all very um, like James Jackson, Esther Cooper, Ed Strong and his Augusta Strong, um, the Burnhams, they all um, married each other. They um, were, they lived as co-partners, co-equals, right? In a time where there was still a lot of misogyny about what men were supposed to do and what women were supposed to do, right? Um, and really lived out the lives that they believed in, right? In, in a remarkable way. John Murphy's question about the black uh, activism can also be measured not by black activism, but by repression. That what happened to the SNYC was the Red Scare, smashed it, um, gone by 4950. And then the next wave of repression was Richard Nixon's uh, war, on, war on crime. The COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence operation, smashed yeah. the Black Panthers, killed Fred Hampton in his sleep. And yeah. the, the Panthers were given such a but they were being shot at and killed. They shot back, what can I say? But they were also being very effective in doing inner city organizing, feeding kids, taking care of people. And um, and the, so you, we see that the more effective, the more threatening an organ, uh, and a movement gets, the more repression it builds. So you can track the repression as well as the movement. You're right, absolutely. And actually some of my other scholarship is about late 1960s Chicago and a remarkable moment in 1969 where you had the three largest black street gangs coordinating civil rights, black power activism in the city. Um, it took a lot of repression to bring that down. Well, I think we're going to talk about Chicago, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if we have some time, I think we'd be interested to hear about your more recent scholarship, but um, I, I see in the chat too, Russell pointed out that uh, the album you showed us earlier, it reminded him of Cannonball Adderley's Live and Operation Breadbasket. So I think, oh, again, yeah. that that idea of, of how culture works with all of this is, is really important. Um, and also, this is a question that I think is an interesting one. Um, so Adam Clayton Powell is a figure who pops up in the chapter we read. Um, the question in the chat that I, I got was, um, why didn't Adam Clayton Powell come to the to event in 1946? He wasn't at it, was he? No, he was invited and he was one of the three featured people. And at the last minute, he gave some excuse like he missed his plane or his plane got canceled or something. Um, I never was able to find a smoking gun in the archive that gave me so, some sort of specific reason. But I have my hunch that he realized just how radical this was going to be. And he wasn't quite sure if a politician from Harlem should be involved in this. That was, that's my guess. But I never saw any document that said that. He, he, uh, he, was, he was supposed to come and he was one of the featured people in the program, but he didn't, he didn't actually show up for the, comp, for the, for the legislature. I think that says something that Adam Clayton Powell basically said, this is too hot for me and just decided <laughs> not to show up. Um, I, I, I do have a question though, um, going back to, to what you mentioned about what folks were learning and in the school, but that's the Simpkins was setting up and everything. Could you talk a bit about what sort of black history they were learning? Cause you, you allude to this talking about the reconstruction um, material that's available at the convention, but could you talk a bit about what they are learning about Black history that maybe contradicts what the more popular image of Black history was in the 1940s or, or lack thereof, really? Wow, yeah, that could be like another hour-long lecture, but um, 
to be brief, I mean, I think during the same mid 1930s to mid 1940s period, you also have a renaissance in the arts and in history and in writing. And um, you see it in the art of Elizabeth Catlett and Charles White. Um, these were people who were intimately involved in the NNC and the SNYC. Um, they're trying to depict a revisionist history of African Americans as um, resistant to their oppression, not passive. Um, and I would argue they're trying to make African American history as not marginal to American history, but central to American history. So it's not this thing over here that's not that important, but it's actually the center of American history is the, is these, are these African-American freedom struggles, right? So everyone from um, Langston Hughes to, um, you know, um, all of the kind of artists and playwrights and novelists and historians are really crafting um, a significant revision to African American history. And I should add, you know, communists um, like Herbert Apthecker, who was a great friend of Majeska Simpkins, wrote this book called Negro Slave Revolts that to this day holds up as a remarkable um, historical dive into not that slave revolts were an aberration to slavery, but they were widespread. Right, and that African Americans did not take slavery as um, a given, right? Or that accept they never accepted their enslaved status, and I think that was really important to elevate the activism of these people in the 30s and 40s who were trying to figure out a way forward. When in many ways the generation before them was disappointing the Booker T. Washington generation, or even the Du Bois generation of that earlier period where you know, Du Bois is calling for the talented 10th. Um, one movement that did inspire them just before them was Garvey. Um, no one wanted to admit it publicly, but there are several NNC activists who are actually former Garveyites. And they really, they, they weren't necessarily attracted so much to some of the eccentricities of Garveyism, but they thought the militancy and the emphasis on um, black power was powerful, you know? Um, and it wasn't polite necessarily, right? <laughs> so I think that's, what, that's what's going on here is that it's not just a, a social movement, but it's like, it's like a, a historical, cultural, artistic movement that's accompanying the social movement that's really um, for the first time sort of validating African-American history in powerful ways. Right, and, and I often tell my students at Claflin, um, which is an HBCU, I always tell them when I teach African-American history that every generation of Black Americans said, says to themselves, we are more militant than the previous generation. We're gonna do the things they couldn't do. And it's almost like a, a cycle, whether it's a new Negro movement or <laughs> The civil rights era or the black power movement and and before we get the next question because there's, there's a good question to chat to saw um i also want to share with everyone there's a there's a film that i show every year to my african-american history class it's called uh the negro soldier and it was produced during world war ii it was shown primarily to black audiences but it was a way to to gen up support for the war effort and it's it's unique in the sense that it's one of the rare times where the federal government acknowledged this black history that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, again, albeit largely the black audiences, but even they're saying, yeah, there's this black history of, of citizenship and solidarity that we should talk about to general mm -hmm. support for the war. I always show this to my students and they're always uh, a bit surprised by it. Um, now there is a, a good question here that I think is, is important that you kind of allude to. Um, it's about the demise of the SNYC. Uh, how exactly did the organization come to an end? Was it FBI activity? Was it something else? Was it a combination of factors? And a follow-up to that was, was there a successor organization that 
it took up its mission, so to speak, after it was hmm. dismantled in 1949. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, first on the topic of the Negro Soldier, that is a great film, and it's actually in my NNC book because the NNC loves that film, and they start screening it and trying to promote it. Um, while at the same time, they're picketing other films like um, uh, that Disney film in 46, Song of the South. They're like picketing that, they're picketing Gone with the Wind, et cetera, um, as false tales about Negro history, right? That's what they're calling it. Um, there's this famous slogan for the Song of the South where they say something like, um, Disney, um, your history is confusing. It's never amusing. Go back to Mickey Mouse or something like that. Um, but about your question, um, sorry, now I lost track of the question. I got so excited about the Negro soldier. Well, the, the question again was, uh, what really brought the SNYC to oh, an end? Oh, to the demise, yeah. Um, that is the topic of next week's lesson, so don't step all over Birmingham. Okay, I'll just do a, a real quick, <laughs> quick version of it, which is that um, the climate becomes so inhospitable yeah. for their kind of activism. Um, you know, unless you turn yourself into a good patriotic liberal, you're blacklisted. Um, you know, there's an NNC leader in DC who gets thrown in jail. NNC leaders who are immigrants like Ferdinand Smith get deported. Um, and it starts also by a kind of um, trickle down way where like the CIO um, sends a letter out from its leadership saying that the, you can no longer work with the following organizations. And one of those organizations is the SNYC. So you're prohibited as a local in Charleston, South Carolina from working with anyone who's SNYC. Um, you're on the attorney general's list of subversive organizations. You have to register your group with the federal government as a subversive, or, you know, all these things are just, I mean, it's hard enough to fight white supremacy when you're just fighting the white supremacists, right? The federal government is just wiping a whole generation of activists off the stage through anti-communism. And it's brutal and traumatic, um, you know, one of Esther Jackson's kids actually um, is a psychologist and her PhD thesis is about the trauma of McCarthyism for children, for the children who live through that. FBI agents following them around, tailing them to school, harassing them. It's, it's, it's abominable, right? I mean, they take away Du Bois's passport, right? I mean, just the things that were done in the name of hunting communists were just, I won't step over next week, but it was impossible for the SNYC to continue as an organization as a result of this level of repression. The next question that was part of that was what came afterwards that was analogous. And I want you to get into the unanswered question of how come the, the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, yeah. didn't apparently have any awareness and Ella Baker never mentioned it. Uh, this, it's a question I've seen raised, but I haven't seen it really answered. Mm. Um, okay, oh, right. So other organizations. So um, when the NNC collapses, a new organization mm -hmm. that some SNYC members join called the Civil Rights Congress, right? It's a different kind of organization. It's much more of a legal organization led by William, the black communist William Patterson. Uh, so that's one organization that some of these leftists file into. A number of them start writing for Paul Robeson's 1950s newspaper called Freedom, which was a quite a remarkable publication out of New York. Um, but then others, you know, they don't end up in any, like Rebels Caton was the head of the NNC in 1946-47. By 1949, he's driving a bus. I mean, that's the reality of being blacklisted from everywhere, right? Um, in terms of the connection between the SNYC and SNCC, I don't know if the definitive sort of piece has been written yet. Um, uh, my colleague out at UCLA, um, 
whose name I'm forgetting. Robert, help me. <laughs> um, who's the uh, wonderful uh, African-American scholar at UCLA? Uh, shoot. Um, You're not talking about Robin Kelly, are you? Not Robin, but... Um, uh, Give me a second. I think I know what you're talking about. It's just getting late. Um, oh, No Coward Soldiers. Who wrote that book? No Coward Soldiers. It's such a good book. Uh, it is by Waldo Martin. Waldo E. Martin, yeah. So Waldo Martin, 10 years ago, he claimed to be writing an article or a book about the connections between SNYC and SNCC and claiming that he had found many, many connections but he has yet to publish that piece. So I keep waiting for him to do it. Um, I think there's more connections than we realize. I do think there are some young people who got involved in SNCC who had never heard of SNYC. They just never had heard of it, right? But um, eventually all of them did, right? I mean, Freedom Ways is like one of the key journals that's promoting that group of SNCC, letter SNCC leaders to go to Africa in like 1965. So, those connections are there. Um, Jack O'Dell, I mean, you know, those connections are there. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of others, but there are others that are, um, um, that are there too. Um, even if like some of the key leaders like John Lewis or like Bob Moses claim that they've never heard of the Southern Negro Youth Congress, I think a lot of others had. There were some hard decisions made when, in 64 leading up to 64 when the white people pulled out because yeah. a lot of the, the older <clears throat> white people, the um, Ann Braden uh, and her husband and some, I can't remember other names, uh, had relationships with the, <clears throat> the Southern Conference on Education and things that did have yeah. relationships. I mean, coming out of the South, the people that were doing that type of work in the 30s and 40s uh, had relations, they were, they were at least socialist and they may not have been like big supporters of the Soviet Union, but right. people were afraid of them. Yeah. Um, oh, one other connection, James Foreman. Before James Foreman joined SNCC, he is, who's, who's James Foreman's mentor? St. Clair Drake at Roosevelt University. St. Clair Drake was an NNC member during World War II. He knew all these people, right? The connections are there. They just some Waldo Martin needs to publish that thing, or I'm going to have to do the research and do it myself because <laughs> I, I think it's important to make those connections um, or show the lack of connections, right? Because there was that fear there, and there was that blacklisting and isolation of people. You know, I mean, look what happened to Paul Robeson. He goes from being a total household name in the 1940s, not just in Black America, but every American, to Right, this person who's totally isolated and um, made into a sort of pariah, right, of American life. Right, and I, 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 another question again. This is like going back to what we've been talking about this evening in terms of links between movements and events. And this is a, a question uh, from Russell, and we're going to talk more about this in, in early May when we we'll talk about the uprising of '34. Uh, but his question is, did the uprising of, of 34 have any influence um, on some of the later union movements in the South, or was the textile workers union too disconnected from the Black community? So I think this is more of a reference to Operation Dixie in the 1940s and the like. Um, I would argue it was too disconnected to African Americans. Um, I don't, I'm trying to think of any of those any of those 34 uprisings really were connected. The Southern mills were segregated. Yeah. I mean, I was just reading about the Lore mills and Gastonia. Um, mm -hmm. There were some interesting, there was like a, one of the leaders was actually living, was white, but living in the black community um, of Gastonia. Um, but I don't think those connections, I, I don't know of any connections there. Um, um, yeah, that'd be an I, interesting I, project. I, yeah, I, <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will say we are bringing in uh, Dr. Michelle Haberlin on uh, May 1st to Ooh, talk okay. about the rising of 34. 
So Russell, you should hold that question for her. I, I was one of her students at Georgia Southern back years ago. So she would have some more insight into that as well. Um, Let me know the answer. I, I will, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, all right, so there's one last comment in the chat from, from Don. Uh, I think is is a good way to think about what we've learned this evening. Uh, he wrote, I like your phrase, freedom struggles. Mm. The current Republican Party is legislating for their version of freedom, gun rights, right to life, freedom, critical race theory, et cetera, all the while suppressing and obliterating the African-American version of freedom struggles. Mm. Um, so I think that's that's an interesting meditation on how traditionally there have been different ideas of freedom and liberty throughout American history. And we're seeing that yeah. certainly today. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that, except for um, when my book came out, this book on the NNC that you all read from, thank you, by the way, for reading the chapter. Um, it was what, 20, was it 2006, I think? 2012, sorry, 2012. 2006 was the dissertation. In 2012, nobody was talking about fascism. So I was going around talking about this movement in the 30s that was anti-fascist and anti-racist. And people were looking at me like I was crazy. Like that doesn't have anything to do with my life in this period, right? And now look at where we are. I mean, anti-fascism and that kind of activism embedded in these struggles from the 30s and 40s that show the ingenious kind of creativity of black Americans in the struggle could not be more relevant than right now, right? I mean, it's just, I, I wish it wasn't true that right now my book is more relevant than it was 10 years ago, right? But we've, we've gotten to a place in America where it is, it's never been more relevant to talk about fascism in America. Um, and the Republican party is, um, there, I mean, they're not a political party anymore. They're, they're a group of, um, I don't even know where to go with that, except for to say uh, a lot of the grassroots support for it is really scary. And I know that they do believe in freedom, but it's, it's, a, it's a very narrow version of freedom, right? Um, it's a libertarianism, it's, um, it's, it's hateful, it's not democratic, so. I think, you know, to end on a positive note, I don't mean to be such a downer. Like, I really do feel like in the same way that the SNYC was trying to look back to reconstruction of the 1860s and the early 1870s as for a usable past to move forward, we should be looking back to these 30s and 40s struggles for a usable past to move forward in anti-fascist democratic directions as well. You've come to the right place for that, Dr. Galvin. <laughs> I know, and I always appreciate um, the invitation to come here and talk with you all. Well, do come back May Day. <laughs> okay. for, for, uh, Robert, that was one of his undergraduate teachers at Georgia Southern. Great. All right, so once again, thanks Dr. Gellin for a great presentation. Please everyone give him a round of applause. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, so speaking of, of, of repression and, and how these things both come to an end and how they continue to inspire people next week, we are gonna get into that period from 46 or the 1950s where in South Carolina and across the country, you're seeing the second Red Scare, McCarthyism really put a damper on the human rights movement and at the same time, create the conditions that make even the civil rights movement have to negotiate uh, very narrow ideological corridors. Uh, so that's coming up next week. Um, and then we'll also, as you can see on, on the schedule online, we've got some really fun uh, deeper dives coming up and some really important sessions coming up. Before we end, I do want to put one last thing in the chat. Um, I haven't talked much about this, but uh, starting a few days ago in King Street, uh, there is a, an, a Smithsonian exhibit that's come to South Carolina called Voices and Votes. Um, the link I just shared with you guys in the chat shows you the various locations 
Uh, I'm actually working on the Voices and Votes site at Claflin, Orangeburg, which will be coming there in October of this year. But if you're near one of these places, you should you should take a look at the exhibit because it talks about the importance of voting rights for our democracy. Uh, in each part of the state is is adding its own spin. So, for example, King Street is talking about uh, the civil rights movement there, King's appearance there in 1966 and the like. Uh, I know in Orangeburg, we're going to discuss the Orangeburg massacre, but also talk about the importance of HBCUs to democracy, things like that. So this is going to tour the entire state. Take a look at the various places it'll be at. It may be your neck of the woods sooner or later. Uh, but on that note, again, this was a wonderful class. Uh, I just want to remind folks again, uh, despite the fact that the class is talk about a lot of heavy subjects that we should always remember to keep the faith and to keep pressing on. So again, everyone have a wonderful evening. Uh, to close us out this evening, we're going to hear from Paul Robeson.